as a software engineer, would I want to invest time and do open source in a company that's actually has a purpose to build a business on its own? So <coughs> the question is really, why would I do it? And from the perspective of LinkedIn, now you may not know much about LinkedIn or LinkedIn or LinkedIn, depending on how you pronounce it in different countries. But um, sorry, the <coughs> What we're trying to achieve at LinkedIn, our mission is to connect the world's professional, to make them more productive and successful. The key verb here is connect. We are a social network. And the goal of that social network is in a professional space. Our vision is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And that's what drives us to come to work every morning and every day. And um, that's what we're trying to achieve. The difference between the mission and the vision in that the mission is very, um, you can measure it, you can measure your success, whereas the vision, you, it's aspirational, it's inspirational. I don't believe that LinkedIn will ever be able to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce, but we certainly strive to make as much progress as possible. I had created a deck which I'll share with you across three questions, the what we open source, the who is open sourcing, and the why we open sourcing. But I'll focus just on the why, so I'll jump through my deck and you can uh, take a look at it later on. I'll just go quickly. Uh, the, the, my point on the what we open source is everything is open sourced. Everything that you can think of, and this is a picture of the uh, everything store from I, um, Amazon. Everything is out there. There's nothing that is not open source. There's no ideas, no software that exists in a given company that's supposed to be proprietary that it's not open sourced. So the question is then, who is open sourcing? I was going to say, well, there's a lot of developers. If you look at the numbers from GitHub, it's, it's a ton. And it's a biased number. It doesn't cover everything or everyone. It's about millions of developers. And um, if you look at it from the perspective of companies, um, it's just about everybody. I'll let you look at the deck more closely. My point here is not to highlight some names vis-a-vis uh, -vis others. It's just saying that every company is now moving into the open source. And I would have put Airbus, sorry about that. So why do we do it? And I'll answer the question from uh, the perspective of an engineering manager. Not necessarily from the perspective of a business developer person or not necessarily from the perspective of marketing or etc. Me as a software engineer, why would I invest time into uh, open source? So the first idea that you may come up is say, well, it's free. We are always operating on the resource constraint. We don't have all the engineers that we need. We don't have all the software developers that we need. Therefore, if I open source something that I need to build, why don't I, I would be able to reach out to the community of developers. Since there are millions of them, I don't have to pay them, they're free. So it's free labor. And I believe naively everybody who studied to think about open source studied from that perspective. So let me tell you that that's a fallacy. Uh, it's not true. Open sourcing code is not free because on one side, your code is useful to you. It means something, it works for you. And now you think about open sourcing it. But your code has a lot of artifacts that are related to the way that you build internally. Uh, it has a lot of tracking things internally that is not standard to the open source. So you need to extract all of that. And that's sunk cost. That refactoring is not free. So now instead of getting free labor, you're wasting labor to make something available to others. So it's certainly not free. Then on the other hand, if you open source something, uh, the code will start have a life of its own. It will start, the community will drive you to do something that you may not necessarily want. And in that is going to diverge which in the end, you may even have to fork your own code in order to sustain the use cases that you have. So in the end, the calculation about having a free um, environment or a free so, uh, labor force is completely wrong. So definitely not free. So why do we open source? Well, we open source from the perspective of branding. So that's one of the factors. If you think about it, when you start um, your company or you start your engineering team, Nobody knows about you. They may know the product that you're building, but they don't know about the quality of the engineering team. And when you start hiring individual in your growth phase, it takes quite a long time to get individual interesting into your jobs and figuring out 
why would they ever want to work for you? Why is it that, what is it that you're doing so well that would attract that talent? But your code tells the story of what your engineering team is actually doing. And it tells it in a way that it's completely transparent because you can look at my code and you can say, well, that's what they do. Then the community take that perspective and can take a look at it without having any biases on their own time and figuring it out whether you actually are a good engineering team or you're not. By just looking at the code itself, but also looking at the project that you have open source. If the project that you have open sourced are little things that don't necessarily matter that much or they are completely done in a way or the architecture is completely wrong, that's going to hurt your brand also. So the problem is if you want to build a branding through open source, then the couple of things that you need to really make sure of, first is you need to understand that there's a community behind it. And if you're open sourcing something, you're joining a community. You're not the community itself. You're part of it, nothing more, nothing less. And by this, it means that you need to sort of give away that control of your software. Because again, it has a purpose on its own. And it's not entirely driven through you. That's hard to manage. It's not very, very easy. You also need to be a good citizen. It's very, very easy to say, well, I've created something that's great. I'm going to open source it. And then you may fall on your face because there's already an open source project out there that's doing exactly the same thing that you're doing. So if the purpose is to build a brand and you're open sourcing something that already exists, you're going to look like a fool. Because again, you're not part of the community. You, you, you thought that you were better than the community by doing so. So you have to just step out, look at what is it that you're doing that may be different. And at that time, you can even realize that maybe your code, instead of being a standalone open source code, should be a packet someplace or should be integrated someplace else. Should be an extension of an existing open code software. Then the code has to be transparent. It's very, very easy within a company to say, well, I'm just a software developer. Coding is for CCs. Uh, sorry, commenting is for CCs. That you don't do it. On the, because if I want to pair code with someone, that, person, that other person sits right next to me. They don't sit on another continent. Well, that's no longer the case if you want to open source within uh, the broad wild community. So the code itself has to be rather transparent and easy to understand. And in the end, uh, people will judge you by your code. If your code doesn't have good abstraction, it has huge classes, uh, the data models are completely wrong, et cetera, et cetera, and it's not going to go that far. So building a brand on your open source component is actually not that easy. You need to invest time to do it right. But it is a valuable exercise because in the end, people will know how good you are, and it's much easier than to hire great talent to participate into the problems that you're trying to tackle. And that leads me to another side. The other side is, okay, what drives individuals? Why, why would a software engineer join LinkedIn or Airbus? Why would they work for them? And there's really three motivations that I can think of. And it doesn't come from me, it's from literature, I guess. Uh, one is a sense of purpose. I joined this company because it has a purpose and I agree to it and I buy to it and I think it's a very good one. It's a very... Um, aspiring or inspiring one. And that's sort of tied to the vision. One is I'm autonomous in my work. I can make decisions. I'm not just a peon. Some, I'm not just doing what somebody else tells me. And the third one is about mastery. I want to be better at what I'm doing. I want to grow. I want to grow in my craft. And I want to develop. And that's especially true for software engineers. If you look at the, the way that our science has developed in the recent past, there are lots of components that did not exist five or six or seven years ago. Um, my co colleague previously from Airbus pointed to Hadoop. Hadoop did not exist before 2006, seven. Um, today, artificial intelligence is kind of the next big thing. Well, before the, the advent of GPUs, it didn't really go anywhere. So it's two years old. So there are a lot of patterns that come all the time and we completely constantly learn. So mastery is really critical. And that parallels to what I said before. And you can decorticate it across the, the, the dimensions. At the community level, what does it actually mean? Well, within a company, 
you have the proverbial of three. You can choose time, quality, or features, but you can only optimize on two of these dimensions. And it does make sense. Like if you fix time and you fix my feature sets that are non-negotiable, then quality will go down. There's no way I can be really, really good at it. Because what was gonna happen is, when I scope my features, how long it's going to take, I am most likely underestimated. But since that set is non-negotiable, and time is non-negotiable, in order for me to hit the deadline, I need to let go of quality. That's not true for the community or open source. The dimension that is often compromised on is time. It's never quality, and it's never feature set. And sometimes you can argue a little bit about feature set, but certainly not to the level that you would go down on quality. So from the perspective of mastery, you're going to get better and better because quality always matters. Then, if you look at the way that you document now your, uh, your code or your packet, it's meant to teach others. It's no longer just meant to document what it does. Because if it was just staying at that point, nobody would actually waste their time to take a look at it. It takes too long. There are many choices. So now you need to think about uh, how do you describe what your component is doing in a way that everybody else can understand without having to reach out to you which leads to the code itself. It has to be transparent because in the end, as software developer, and that's another fallacy, it, we don't code all the time. We spend much, much, much more time to understand what the code does. We have bugs to fix, we have things to do, and how do we fix bugs? Because it's somebody else's bugs that you need to fix. Well, you look at the stack trace, you figure out where it is, you understand the code, trying to figure out what it does, what it doesn't do, what does the unit test do, does or not, doesn't do. And all that time is before you actually really code. So you spend a lot more time looking at code, understanding it, than code it itself. And for the open source community, well, since you're not next to me, the code has to be really well written for you to really understand it, therefore rise, raising my mastery. All this says basically that uh, from the open source perspective, code is a craftsmanship, it's not a hack. You're not gonna do it very quickly in order to just move on which is sometimes in the enterprise software you do. And in the end, well, your code is your reputation. That's your business card. It has your name, it will carry it forever. It's not gonna change. So mastery is certainly one dimension that we actually open source. Now the last thing that I wanted to say here is like, well, we're not so naive also that what we perceive as being a strategic advantage that we will actually open source it. That's not true. What we perceive as being a strategic advantage for any company, you will not open source it. That's your first inclination. What's starting to change, which is a little bit of a fallacy these days, is that, well, it's maybe it's a strategic for you, but not for somebody else. So sooner or later, somebody will pick it up. And I can give you one explicit example. Google has always perceived that their infrastructure is a strategic advantage for them. In 2003 and 2004, they published papers about GFS and MapReduced, which basically then, some years later, created an open source project that's called Hadoop, that took some years to develop, but that wasn't Google's one, it was somebody else. Doug Cutting took it for Lucene, and then open source it separately, because it became big enough, and that's the, the inception of, let's say, big data. Today, that has changed. It's changed because, I guess, the cloud computing. You want to attract, big players want to attract participants onto their own cloud, and you can see that even at Google it has changed because TensorFlow was actually open sourced instead of being closed sourced from before, and it is a competitive advantage to them. So we open source because uh, it builds up our engineering brand. It makes our engineers better. Better engineers code better. Uh, they can tackle more complex problems. And um, we open source because that doesn't provide us a competitive advantage to hold that inside. We do not open source because it's free labor and just because we can. Thank you.